I got really excited when I found out I was going to be here at Monroe High School. I've done this presentation at other schools, but I got really excited to be at Monroe High School because you're looking at a graduate of the class of 1989. Uh-huh. <laughs> Good Lord, if they would just bring back feathered hair, I'm telling you, I had the best feathered hair ever. <laughs> also, in 2010, I had uh, rung for the school board, and I was a member of the Monroe Public School Board, so really excited to be back here again. That's me. Um, after the school board, I had to um, get sworn in as an assistant prosecutor. Now, who can tell me here, when are, in the state of Michigan that is, when are you considered an adult for the purposes of the criminal justice system? When at the age of 18. Well, in the age of Michigan, you are considered an adult for criminal justice at the age of 17. Now, why is that important? This confuses a lot of people. Because at 17, you can't vote, you can't sign a contract, and you certainly can't drink a beer, but you can go to jail at the age of 17. So even though you're still in high school and you're not an adult yet, civilly, for criminal purposes at the age of 17, you are an adult. So that's important to know as high schoolers because plenty of you are gonna be at the age of 17 and above. As Ms. Krebs talked about, and I'm sure, you know, I, I know you, you uh, wrote in your paper, uh, technology has really increased our ability to communicate with others. And, you know, that's, that's through computers. I mean, long gone is the day of the old school pen pal that you might have, you know, uh, correspondence with in France or something like that. No, you, you can just contact people by email. You have messengers, everything. It's, it, it's really kind of incredible. I mean, cell phones, I mean, easier phone access, I mean, Gone is the day of having to find a payphone late at night because your car broke down. I mean, good luck finding a payphone now. Uh, you can text. You don't even have to actually physically talk to the person on the phone. And I mean, it's just a little mini computer. I mean, this little thing I use just like anyone uses a computer. And I use it all the time. Uh, it always amazes me because when I was in high school and we had our computers, I mean, the memory and the ability of that computer pales to my phone. Then of course we got social media. I mean, you know, these are all the standards, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram. I mean, heck what, there's Kick, there's Glide. Every time I turn around and look at a police report or a search warrant, I'm finding out a new messenger system, okay? Uh, that probably should be updated by anything. And, and like I said, we have the ability to communicate with anyone, anywhere, at any time. But that ability has caused a number of problems a lot of people don't think about. And a lot of teenagers uh, are ending up getting charged with crimes involving their computers and cell phones. And the bad part is that most had no idea what they were doing was wrong. And this is originally how I came up doing this program, uh, was for a school district that were, were having a lot of social media problems. And my boss thought it'd be a good idea to get out there and educate students rather than just prosecuting them. So hopefully you learned something here today. So, I mean, we have the internet, it's great, and everyone likes a joke. Sometimes jokes can go too far, and this case is kind of near and dear to my heart because it was one of the first ones I handled uh, when I became a prosecutor, and I call it the Craigslist case just because I don't want to involve the kids that were involved in it. And basically, this is a prime example of cyberbullying and a practical joke that went too far. Basically, uh, there was a, a young male teenager, I believe he was, I think he just turned 13, uh, a bunch of guys at school, uh, they weren't his friends either. Uh, they, they created a Craigslist account in his actual name. They placed a fake ad using his real name and his real cell phone number. And this was for the purpose uh, to meet up with other men to perform various sexual acts on them. Basically said, hey, I want to do all this stuff to you. Give me a call. 
So, I mean, that's funny, right? It's a harmless joke. No one got hurt. That victim received 100 phone calls before they figured out what the heck's going on. He's getting unsolicited phone calls from 100 people and had no idea why, because he didn't put the ad up. He had to change his number, suffered mental anguish, had to seek counseling in the thousands of dollars. The adults were soliciting a minor under the age of consent for sexual acts, which is a whole felony right there. There was a police investigation, search warrants, uh, computers taken, and the end result, those guys for playing a joke, I happened to find a new charge, which was a two-year felony, because without his permission, they posted a message in an electronic medium, and it was for the intent to basically harass, intimidate him, uh, and that happened. So they ended up with felonies on their record. And then here's the big one, too. The reimbursed government for expenses incurred from a violation, it is not cheap to use the software and search all these computers. And sometimes, especially when there's overtime involved with the officers, you have to pay that as well. Sexting. Uh, basically, and I'm sure this isn't the first time you've heard about this, but it's sending suggest suggestive pictures or texts uh, to another individual with your phone or electronic device. And this is an area that I think a lot of teens get confused on because they're sending their own stuff. They're sending pictures of themselves and they don't necessarily think that's a problem. But sending those pictures of yourself or your friends can get you in a lot of trouble with the law. And, and like I said, I mean, it is, even though it's your own picture and you're sending it, you are transmitting child pornography uh, to others. It's a very serious crime. And, you know, I know people think it's romantic, fun, or even adventurous, but it can get you arrested, it can get you convicted, and you'll be on a, a list for probably most of your adult life, if not all of it, as a sex offender. So you have to be on that list that, you know, every year you have to tell them where you're at, well, sometimes four times a year, depending on the charge. And, you know, your picture's on there, and you're listed as a sex offender with all the rapists and everything like that. This knucklehead, he got uh, mad at his girlfriend when they broke up. So, of course, what does a mature person do? He circulated a nude picture of her to 70 people, including her parents. He was convicted of transmitting child pornography. Harold Fields was charged with possessing child pornography when he and other high schoolers were found with nude photos of a minor on a cell phone. So this is another area to keep in mind. The age of consent where you can legally have sex in the state of Michigan, where you can consent to sex, is 16. This is where I think some teenagers get confused. That may be so, but until you're 18, you cannot take pictures of yourself and send them to people where you are in uh, you know, where your clothing is off, where you are showing nude photos of yourself. And, and a bunch of guys had pictures that three girls took and sent to them, and that is possessing uh, child pornography. Jessica Logan's a, a interesting story because uh, she was an 18-year-old uh, when she died, and uh, she basically... Uh, had a boyfriend, got mad, and he sent all these pictures to some younger classmates than her. And she got bullied something awful, and she uh, lived in the Cincinnati area, and she even had the courage to go and do a uh, television interview because she didn't want this to happen to any other uh, teenager. And uh, the tragic thing is when her mother uh, found her hung because Jessica never talked about what happened to her at school to her mother. Her friends knew about it, but her mom had no idea all this bullying was going on. But the, the tragic thing is when she was hung, the uh, phone, her phone was in the center of the room. Dr. Laura, she's basically a radio 
post. She likes to uh, always talking a very high moral virtue and stuff like that. In her youth, she had taken some nude and semi-nude photographs for a boyfriend. Some, something from way long ago. And decades later, he sold them to an entertainment, entertainment group, uh, which eventually published them on the internet. And even with all her money, she fought in federal court and ultimately lost, and the pictures were allowed to still be up. Keep in mind, there's long-term implications when you send any uh, picture. I mean, you got the humiliation, depression, you've heard of death. You can have school suspension or expulsion, depending on some of the circumstances. It will have an impact on your college, maybe military admissions, on job prospects. Have to explain the picture to your future child. You could have a criminal conviction, prison, sex offender registration. And Joe, I, I know we deal with this a lot. What, what, what's some of the situations that you deal with that maybe teens have misunderstandings about? The girls or the boys will share it with their friends. So boy will send a picture to a girl, she shares it with her friends, he finds out about it, is upset. Uh, and vice versa. And a lot of times it comes from, you know, the parents find out that this has gone on, he shares it to him, and then he, he has doesn't have the same connection with me. So he's not going to respect that photo or anything else about it. He thinks it's funny, he thinks it's cute, sends it to everybody in this room. Now everybody has it. The problem you have is you don't have any control over it anymore. Once it's gone, once you've sent it on, you don't have the control over it, so it can go anywhere and be posted anywhere. Um, so embarrassing, sure. Uh, Long-term effects, like you said, depression, you start missing school, grades start dropping, those kind of things start happening. The other problem you have is that you don't know where it went. That means some creep that we don't even know about gets possession of it and then does it whatever they're going to do with it. And, and, you know, I can tell you firsthand from a uh, child pornography case I handled, but it was dealing with an adult. I had five years of pictures to review. I read five years of this person's uh, texts and emails, and it's amazing what other crimes you find out. I mean, most importantly, I knew all this person's personal, personal information. So keep in mind when you do this that someone like myself or Detective Hammond, if we're gonna be looking through your phone, we can see everything. So all your private thoughts, feelings, anything that you've looked at on the web, anything, we get to see. And I don't want people going through my phone. I mean, I know most people don't. That's that's one of the, the main issues, like Detective Hammond was saying, is it seems like that phone, especially with you know youth, that is like the big thing. Don't touch the phone potential charges, and, and this is where you'll start seeing where it gets big. If, if you coerce or ask or knowingly allow someone to produce, that means taking a picture and send it, that's a felony punishable up to 20 years in prison. And let me tell you, the guidelines are not pretty on this. You will go to prison on this. There is no uh, take a stop at jail for a while and do some probation. No, this is straight prison time distributing so if someone sent you a picture and you sent it on you've just committed a seven-year felony just mere possession of what's called child sexually abusive material which is child pornography just the mere possession of it could even be a picture of yourself uh, four years in prison that's a felony all of these mandatory sex offender registration so when people run your name it, it's just going to say child pornography as your charge. When you're older, they're not going to know, hey, I was, you know, 17 and I screwed up by sending a picture to somebody. No, they're going to think that you're one of those pervs out there that, you know, have all these uh, pictures that they exchange of young children. They're not going to realize the circumstances. There's not a, a portion on that web page that allows you to give your explanation of what happened. No, people are just, oh, great, we're living next to this person and they're a perv. That, that's what they're going to think. If the recipient of that picture, and this is going to happen a lot in the school set, setting, is less than 17, you know, distributing it, that's a two-year felony. Furnishing it, 
that ends up to being a 90-day misdemeanor. <clears throat> Exhibiting, that would be just, hey, look at this. That's a misdemeanor as well, 90 days in jail. Terrorism. This is a big, big problem that we deal with at least a few times a year. A person is guilty of making a terrorist threat or of making a false report of terrorism if they do either of the following. Threatens to commit an act of terrorism and communicates that threat to any other person. Knowingly makes a false report of an act of terrorism and communicates the false report to any person, knowing the report is false. Now, this is the big one. It is not a defense to a prosecution under this section that the defendant did not have the intent or capability of committing the act of terrorism. And that's because in these cases, every time, well, Johnny doesn't have any guns at the house. He doesn't have any access. He doesn't know how to build a bomb. It doesn't matter if you said it and you published it, you are guilty of a 20 year felony. And, and like I said, this happens a lot and it requires a lot of police effort. We send people out, we search homes, we go through and, and look at everything in that house to see if there's a weapon or anything that could be capable uh, for any terrorism. So, I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, it's just a joke, so why do we take it seriously? Because we can't afford to take this as a joke. No one wants to see this happen. We're going to take this serious. When we see something like that, it's going to be serious. So be careful what you say or text to others. Think twice before you put that post on Facebook that you think is funny. And we, we sort of touched on that. What happens with your electronic equipment? I mean, if it's your cell phone, if it's a computer, if it's a tablet, whatnot, sometimes all of those, depending on what the offense is, well, we go get a search warrant. And uh, the search warrant's going to say that we can go, you know, depending on the case, if it's a, a terrorist threat, it's going to be a pretty broad search warrant where you're going to want to find all your electronic devices to look at your messages and see what else you've been putting out there. Uh, we're going to be looking for uh, weapons. Weapons can be stored almost anywhere. So basically, we're going through your house. We're going through your parents' stuff, too. I'm telling you, you think you erased it. It is not gone. It is on your phone forever. And that's why uh, if you're charged with a crime, any crime, it's hard to get your equipment back that was used in a crime. You can file a motion, you can do whatever, and sometimes the court might order it back. Anything where child pornography is on, we will not return it. Too bad, so sad. I don't know how many times I've talked to a mother, uh, oh, Johnny needs his cell phone back, we paid 900 bucks for it, it was brand new. I don't care because I'm not going to prison for handing you child pornography. Remember that your parents, teachers, principals, the community and law enforcement all take your safety very seriously. Any and all threats about a school will be investigated and dealt with according to the seriousness of the threat and more than likely you will be charged with a crime and all the consequences that go with that. Uh, likely, if it's a serious threat, like a terrorism threat, I very rarely does someone not go to the youth center until we sort things out. This is an amazing age. The fact we can communicate with everybody, the stuff we can do with computers, the fun we can have with computers. Um, but remember that once you post something, it's there forever. You don't know how other people are going to react to it, so you just can't say, oh, I was joking about that. Uh, remember, potential colleges, employers, they look through uh, your Facebook accounts, all your social media, they Google you to find you doing, they want to see what type of person you are. Okay, what I'd like to do for this section, as we spoke about earlier, I'd like you to ask questions as a journalist and also as a student things that you that you would really like to know too not just the people that you're reporting back to and you might be thinking of a friend something that they may need some information on so I want to turn it back over to Ron all right any questions yes sir um, I'm Nick Schnorberger I'm a senior and uh, I wondered 
like there's a lot of kids that film fights at school and they happen and kind of send them to each other. Is there any sort of legal like trouble if kids can get in for actually sending a video of a fight or having it on their phone? As far as I know with the state, there is not one. Um, I think it would depend on the situation. If the person was filming and encouraging them to fight, that might be, you know, inciting some type of charge like that. But there's nothing really on the books, at least as far as state charges at this point. From an investigative standpoint, um, this school is equipped with a very good surveillance system. Uh, however, sometimes, you know, if you're outside or in an area that's not videoed, the video itself that you take may be good for evidentiary purposes. So we may seek to seize those and then we'd have to do an analysis on it to retrieve the video, which opens up to a lot of things to, you know, pulling off any information that's on that phone. So it causes that problem for you. Then the other problem I know within the school, there are school discipline problems and it comes out of that for the things we were just talking about. I've seen where posts of a fight or comment about the fight after the fact has led to potential second and third fights of people that weren't even involved, you know, just because they made comments about it. So if we can curtail any of that, that really helps. Um, Miss, I think you had a question um, like Sophia Petrangelo, Sr. Um, if something happens outside of the school, at what point does the school get involved? If it's outside of the school day, sometimes a parent will call us first and notify us, and I'll encourage them to contact law enforcement if there's a threat, that type of thing. So that's one way to handle it. If it creates a disturbance at school, we have to get involved. There's case law, you know, back to your, your government class, there's case law that has established that. If it creates a disturbance here, then we get involved. If it doesn't create a disturbance here, and it's with school safety, we still make the necessary calls because student safety is number one. It doesn't matter when we heard about the incident, if they're at risk, we make sure someone is notified, either law enforcement. Sometimes the parent will make contact with a parent just to be aware of it. Sometimes we make a uh, referral to Child Protective Services. Believe it or not, if someone has uh, child pornography on their phone, we have to make a, a, a report to Child Protective Services to protect that minor. So it really gets complicated sometimes. Where do we draw the line? I want to assure you, we don't look for things. We're not out there trolling Facebook and social media. I don't even have a Facebook account, and I did that purposefully. Uh, yes, Ms. Shelby Valeria, Sr. Um, I was wondering how you go about like anonymous Twitter accounts posting things about certain kids. Uh, Twitter, and, and anytime you're dealing with your big major companies, it varies on their reception to receiving a, a search warrant or subpoena to obtain information. Uh, sometimes, and I'm not going to say all the time, but sometimes we are successful in finding out who that individual is by obtaining a court order. Uh, sometimes these organizations will uh, honor that. Where we've had trouble doing it in the past is if one of these organizations is outside of the United States, uh, then it depends on what country. Uh, yes, Ms. Uh, Selena Laura Sr. Why is it like important to you guys that we discuss and share and like cover this topic? Most teens don't know they're doing anything wrong. Uh, a lot of these, I think people are going, hey, I can just do this all day long. I mean, until today, did you know that if you said, hey, I'm going to beat you up and text it, it was a six-month misdemeanor? Mm -hmm. Most don't. I think it's very important uh, that <clears throat> since you use social media all the time, since it's such a big time uh, part of your lives, that it's important that you know what some of the repercussions can <laughs> be if you misuse that. That's exactly the reason. We've had students just this week with the nude picture issues, um, thinking it's harmless. It's not harmless. So hopefully to prevent some behaviors, just the importance of cell phones. And the colleges look at Facebook. Employers look at Facebook. So there's some things you innocently put out there, picture of you partying, even the hashtags or your Facebook account name are less than professional sometimes and they will go right to that. I know we had a football coach. When we put out the applications, you go right to Facebook. What's their presence on Facebook? Because they have to be a role model. 
that makes sense? And sometimes references aren't even called. So I bet there's probably at least half of you right now are thinking, oh my gosh, I've got something out there. I probably might want to take off so I don't give the wrong impression. So just to make you aware of that, that, that social media, that image is there, even if it's Snapchat and it's gone, the image is there and with the right software, they can pull that out. Well, that's for investigations. That's not going to be U of M. So I would recommend you go home. If there's anything on there that doesn't present you in a positive way, if that, here's a test. Would you want your grandmother to see it? All right? Uh, yes, miss. Uh, Caitlin Taylor, Jr. You mentioned in your presentation that you are 17 to be tried as an adult. Correct. Is that at the time of the crime or the time that it's brought to your attention? Uh, it's at the time of the crime. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it gets a little confusing. You have to go back and actually figure out when the crime was committed. So you could be 15 and then still prosecute as an adult, but it's a pretty drawn out process. So we save those for very, very serious cases. Um, Emily Rassel, Jr. What should be the path that students should take if they notice something online that could affect the safety of their peers? So if you notice it in school, tell your teacher. So the teacher can go through whatever process they have, you know, because every building has a process to go through. Uh, if you're at home, tell one of your parents. Uh, it's definitely something the quicker, if, it, if it's of a threatening nature and it's involving the safety of a school or uh, safety of anybody, it's important to contact an adult immediately. Grayson Lee, senior. Um, I was wondering if the school needs like any evidence to go through someone's phone, or are you just allowed to go through someone's phone? So one can give us con one can give you consent to search, or you have to establish probable cause, and then you either get a search warrant. It's really a lot of paperwork. It's not difficult as long as the probable cause is there. The probable cause really is mere suspicion. Uh, it's just like coming to your house. I just can't walk into your house and search. I have to have a reason or consent, and that reason has to be um, documented and then presented in a search warrant. And as a school, our standard is even lower, meaning we, we can search them without a search warrant, with probable cause. We try to do it with dignity, you know, to work with the student. If they totally refuse, then I, you know, get the tech of Hammond involved. But usually, believe it or not, people comply, and I get the parents involved right away, too. We, d we don't look for phones. We can't break a code. We can't do that, you know, but we ask the student to, to comply with us. And if they're innocent, they readily do. They open up their phone. They, we have them go through it. I don't, if I don't have to put my hands on the phone, I don't. That's my personal standard as an administrator. Not all administrators have that standard. I think most of ours do, if not all, because I've worked with them on a few of these things. So we get on those right away, and we want people to comply as best they can, but we do what we need to to make sure we're moving it in a responsible uh, fashion so it doesn't get bigger than it needs to. Uh, Fred Schiff, Jr., Senior. Um, even, oh, even when you're portraying an image uh, in a song, like saying like you would like, kill an anonymous person, how would you go about like prosecuting somebody like that? Would you still be guilty of a 20-year charge? Uh, so it, it would depend. I mean, if you put something on a post saying, you know, in the songs like, I'm going to Monroe High tomorrow and I'm going to blow that up, <laughs> I'm probably going to risk a First Amendment violation. But if it's just something in a song or, you know, I, I've seen it before in the past with some poetry where it was actually confirmed this person had a therapist and they were working out anger issues and that's how the therapist instructed them to do it, that was a little different situation. So that we learned, okay, he's not writing out a plan on how to kill all these students. He's actually, you know, dealing with some bullying issues and that's how he's, you know, coping with it. So that's a really broad subject and I would just, I would have to give my firm legal answer of, it depends. Haley Sellers, senior. Uh, this is a question for Ms. Kreps um, specifically. If a student were to have like multiple quote unquote reports like given to the school of like incidents, is there a point where the school can like step in and like specifically not allow that student to be on social media anymore? No, I would never do that because that's that is freedom of speech and I I'm a former journalist, you mm -hmm. know, I appreciate that. 
what I do do with the parents, I work with the parents, and I've done that before. In fact, the parent begged me one time, take the phone for two weeks. And I'm like, no, because you're paying for that plan. She, But she wanted me to. We put it in the vault for two weeks. They just keep those violations. The parents are fed up. The parents are fed up, too. So I'll, I'll work with the parents, not so much as an administrator, but maybe more in the uh, parent-to-parent. You know, what can you do at home to, to protect your child from themselves mm-hmm. so they don't keep getting themselves in trouble? And some parents, they just shut everything down. But here, I might say, and I have said this to a parent, keep the phone home. Let's just ground them from their phone for a week at school. And the parents have never fought me on that. If I say a week, some of them say two weeks, you know, because how many of your parents get fed up? You know, you've, you've had those conversations with them. Parents are pretty supportive on this. You get an exception every now and then. You still work with them because as a parent, I respect whatever they want to do. But this is what I would suggest. I think. <clears throat> uh, Caitlin Taylor Jr. Going back to the search warrant thing, if you were to get it for like searching for child porn and you found something else, like a drug charge or something, could you be charged on that charge or would it be? I mean, if you're looking for child pornography and you find child pornography, but you find text messages that go towards, you know, uh, an auto theft ring, mm-hmm. that's going to lead you down another path, which is going to re- require different investigative steps. Junior. So if you are going through an investigation and find that they did have it and deleted it, would you confiscate that phone too? Or So that phone's going to be destroyed ultimately. Nobody can possess it. possess it. So yes, if it was something we came across on accident during an investigation, it spurs a whole new investigation, plus you don't get that back. Well, thank you for all your questions. I I really enjoyed doing this presentation. And once again, want to thank you and want to thank uh, Mrs. Krebs, my boss, uh, for allowing me to come out here. And I want to thank Detective Hammond for helping me. Thank you.